Yat A, Shio, hello, and welcome to the fifth presentation of our Indigenous Speaker Series. The Indigenous Education Institute, IEI, along with the National Parks and Bureau of Land Management, is proud and honored to present A Sense of Place, Indigenous Perspectives of Land, Water, and Sky. Our fifth speaker of the series is Chad Kalepa Babayan, who will be speaking today. The title of his talk is, In Losing Sight of Land, You Discover the Stars. My name is Nancy Maryboy, and I'm the founding president of the Indigenous Education Institute. We are a nonprofit institution with an all indigenous board and staff that has been in existence for 25 years. We are located in the San Juan Islands, Washington, and on the Navajo Nation. Our mission is to preserve, protect, and apply traditional indigenous ways of knowing to contemporary life with a focus on native education, environmental change, and sustainable, healthy environments on earth, water, and skies. Much of our work concerns the creation of collaborations with integrity between Western science and traditional indigenous ways of knowing. I would like to begin our series today with a heartfelt acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples of the world. Usually we acknowledge the land on which we are living or presenting, but in this day and age of virtual online realities, we are honoring indigenous people around the world. I would also like to acknowledge the native Hawaiian people of the land and waters of Hawaii, the home of our speaker, Native Hawaiian, Kalepa Babayan. The presentations in this series have been chosen to reflect an awareness of the foundations of traditional thinking. In Native ways, everything is interconnected. So rather than a specific focus on biology, astronomy, or other separate disciplines, we will be presenting worlds of interrelationships and processes of reciprocity. I want to thank you personally for attending this webinar. The interest you have shown is overwhelming. We have almost 600 people registered from all across the United States, and we have participants from all around the world, including Canada, Brazil, Australia, South Africa. It's also interesting that we have more than 120 tribes represented in our registrations for this presentation. I would also like now to turn the mic over to my colleague, Marcia. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Marcia Deshadnay, the manager for San Juan Islands National Monument. One of the purposes for this monument's designation, as it is defined in law, is for the protection, conservation, and restoration of Coast Salish people's resources and cultural properties. As we work with 12 Coast Salish tribes, we strive to fulfill that purpose. Federal land managers across the nation are working on the same challenge, and this is one of the points for this speaker series, expanding awareness and understanding for cultural differences to support more successful working relationships, to support collaboration with integrity. Dr. Littlebear's presentation began this series and detailed the metaphysics of science, the age of reason, Lockean theory, and that the strength of science is in context with its culture. Chad Kalepa Bai Bayan has been a leader in the community of ocean goers, as well as the people of Hawaii. Through his education programming, he has restored light to traditional practices and ways of knowing that empower people in their setting within the environment, and they lead through example. He continues, he continues to mentor this group so successfully. We are very honored to host him today. Following his presentation, we'll offer him some of the questions you've posed during registration. At the very end of this webinar, 
you'll see a page with contact information for each of the partners, and you're welcome to reach out to all of us, any of us, including Vibayan, individually. This and all sense of place Indigenous perspectives on land and sky presentations are shortly following the events. As you're registered by email, we'll also share notices to you for upcoming presentations. I'm really excited about today. Nancy, let's go. Thank you, Marcia. It is my greatest pleasure now to introduce our guest speaker and my friend, Kalefa Babayan, whose talk is called, I'll say it again, I love this term, in losing the sight of land, you discover the stars. Some 4,000 years ago, mariners set out on an epic human odyssey to explore and settle the largest expanse of ocean in the world, Oceania. Pro navigator Kalepa Babayan will speak about the resurgence of oceanic wayfinding, the indigenous art of non-instrument navigation and orientation at sea, voyaging on board double hulled deep sea canoes, and modern day efforts to recapture the spirit of traditional expeditions of exploration. Moving west to east against the direction of the prevailing trade winds, Oceanic explorers, farmers, and traders pointed their canoes upwind and left their footprints on the untouched shores of distant, uninhabited lands. With a tropical star field circling above their heads, they developed a simple system to orient their canoes and to mark the location of newly discovered islands, leading to this remarkable feat of human migration. Born and raised on Maui in the Hawaiian Islands, Kalepa Babayan first sailed on the Hokulea in 1975, a traditionally designed reconstruction of a double hulled deep sea oceanic voyaging canoe. He has since sailed on many major voyages throughout the Pacific. And in 2014, he participated as captain and navigator on the Malamata Voyage, a 47,000 nautical mile Hey everybody, we're having a slight glitch here. Uh, please hold on for a second and I'll try to get Nancy to unmute her microphone so you can hear her. And if she could restart her speaking at the uh, 47,000 nautical mile journey, that would be great. Thank you, Chris. That's exactly where I'll start. Um, uh, that little coyote stepped in once again. He's getting us each. Um, the, the Malama Honua Worldwide Voyage was a 47,000 nautical mile journey around the world that visited 26 countries and stopped at 85 ports. Kalepa currently serves as the navigator in residence at the Imanloa Astronomy Center of Hawaii, developing wayfinding activities, curriculum materials, and conducting outreach. In 2007, his teacher, Master Navigator Mao Pialug, on the tiny Micronesian atoll of Satawal, initiated Kalepa into the Order of Po, a 3,000-year-old society of deep-sea navigators. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Kalepa Babayan. Good morning. Oh, had some issues with my audio. I couldn't hear anything. But the coyote, we fixed him this morning. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, good morning. And I want to thank Nancy and the Indigenous 
Education Institute for this uh, uh, for this invitation to to present this morning, uh, share my story entitled Helani Koluna, Sky Above, in Losing the Sight of Land, You Discover the Stars. So I'm just going to dive into the, um, the PowerPoint so we can get started. Uh, we got about two and a half million years to cover in terms of human history, and we got to do this in an hour. So, so uh, we'll begin. Again, our presentation this morning is entitled Helani Koluna, A Sky Above, Losing the Sight of Land, You Discover the Stars. I'm a, I'm a storyteller. Uh, I spent some 45 years learning about, uh, about our oceanic history um, and, uh, and learning how to uh, navigate this, these large ocean going canoes uh, without instruments, but, but, and that's a story that, that that's very personal and very, very, um, and resonates with me because it's it's my cultural heritage. But in uh, 2014, I took part in the um, in the Malama Honua Worldwide Voyage, in which we, in which we took Hokulea around the world, and as we sailed around the world. I um, I learned a lot about about human culture, and so my story is now sh changed, and and I f to gain a more complete picture as to how we as a, as the oceanic culture came to the world's oceans. You you've, you've got to uh, go back to the very very beginnings of how we first as a human species emerged on these planets. So the story begins. Well, begins or, or ends with, with people, with, with, with humans emerging on islands, but the story actually begins a lot further back in history. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a personal story. And, and, and it's, about, it's about the relationship between the earth, the sky, the sea, and people. And hopefully by the time I get to the end of the story, It'll, um, it'll resonate with you. you. You'll be able to find your place within the story and that, and that, that you, will, you will recognize the story as a contribution or investment in, your, in, in ourselves and in our future. So the story begins here in, in East Africa. Yeah? About two and a half billion years ago, two and a half million years ago, uh, our species emerges on, in East Africa, probably along a river, in grasslands and, and, and forests. And the first of our species is called Homo habilis. So Homo habilis means, uh, uh, means human tool maker. Uh, two and a half million years ago, we are, we are fully bipedalists. We, we, we can't stand on, 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 on two legs, but we're probably using, using our, our hands as well as to, to uh, to stand up. Uh, we're making tools, but our brains are only the size of chimpanzees. And then a million years go by, right? Encephalitis takes place, which is, which is uh, the process of, of increasing brain size relative to, to, to body mass. And our brain size doubles. Over a million years, it takes us to, to uh, double our, our brain size. And, and at that time, about a, uh, about a, a, a million years ago, our, our next species arrives on, on, a, on, a, on a human scene, and it's Homo erectus. Homo erectus is the first homo, homo species to escape Africa. They escape Africa, and they, they settle all of Europe and all of Asia, right? And Homo erectus has its offsprings, uh, Homo antecessor, uh, probably the most noted is uh, Neanderthals, and 
lastly, the, the, the uh, little people of, of Flores Islands, Homo florensis. Uh, one species gets, gets, gets left behind, Homo ergaster. And Homo ergaster be, begats the first fully human species, which is Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens, our, our lineal ancestor, has been on this planet for 200,000 years. We're young. As a, as, a, as, a, as a human species, we're incredibly young. But, but by 200,000 years ago, we're fully de developed bipedalists. We, we, our, our limbs have changed. Our arms have shortened because we're not hanging in trees. Our legs have gotten longer. Um, our canine teeth, we, we've lost it. Uh, and the most, uh, the characteristic that defines Homo sapiens is our brain sizes. Our brain has increased size, has doubled, right? It's not about 13, uh, 1300 uh, uh, cubic centimeters of brain mass. And our, and in that development of our brain, it, it, it develops unevenly so that our frontal cortex, the place where we, we reason and, and develop more profound ideas, gets extremely large. And, and the, 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 our brain growth is directly related to, to environmental changes, right? Environmental changes forces the way we need to rethink about how we live within our environment, the kind of food resources we, 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 need, to, uh, uh, we need to get for our, our communities. And so as we're being challenged, our brains are reacting to it and it grows. About 190,000 years ago, the earth, the earth goes into an ice age and in the Sahara desert expands exponentially and the weather changes. And so these bands of, of maybe only a couple hundred Homo sapiens start to migrate southward looking for warmer climates, but looking for more, uh, uh, more food resources. And so humans get around the planet by walking, by walking. Okay, and so we walk out of East Africa and we migrate all the way south to the very tip of the South African continent. Uh, here in this uh, 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 township identified as Muscle Bay are a series of, of caves. So we arrive on, on, on the South African coastline and we inhabit, we live out in the open, but in inclement weather, we, we reside in these, in these coastal cliffs. And for about 100,000 years, we develop all the human traits that are character characteristically human, right? Like language, uh, we develop art, human ornamentation, we develop fine tools. You know that, that, um, that there's only a 10% de deflection between chimpanzee and human DNA? Only 10%, but that 10% produces us. And that, uh, that even in language, right? Chimpanzees have a language. They make a certain sound and that identifies the lions, right? And so they'll all stand up on their, on their fours and they'll all look. But the difference between a chimpanzee and a human is a human can say lion in the bushes next to the bend in the river by the big tree. That's the difference in, in our ability to think and to articulate ideas. And so as we explore the South African coastline, right, we're tapping into the rich and very diverse system of marine resources. We're eating shellfish, uh, we're eating seaweed, and we're eating uh, 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 washed up carcasses of, of dead whales. And that is a diet high in omega-3. And omega-3, right, fish oil supplements are basically fertilizer for the brain. So we're not only, only uh, increasing our brain size, but we also uh, increase our ability to cognit cognitively think. Uh, and so, yeah, we become, along the Af South African coastline, we become aquatic. We learn how to harvest the world's oceans. Yeah. We learn how to swim. 
and that in itself is is a uh, is a uh, uh, is a hallmark of human development, right? We are the, probably the one social characteristic that defines us as a species is our ability to to organize, to coordinate, and then to create networks of cooperation, right? That ability for us to, to move our communities in organized matter, matter is, is the one defining social characteristic for all humans, right? Today we can build planes and, and, and all the parts can come from, from different sectors, the different places around the world and it'll come to one assembly plant and it'll, it'll be assembled into one complete piece. No other species can, can organize on the scale that humans can. Okay, after 100,000 years, the earth warms, right? We begin to migrate north, yeah? Homo sapiens, yeah? We, we, we cross over into the Middle East, and then we, we inhabit all the far corners of the planet. We go back, we, we, we actually interbreed with Neanderthals. Today they say that like 5% of human DNA is Neanderthals, but we move into Asia and to the, and to the coast of the Pacific Ocean. Right, we are we are extending our reach, but we eventually, Homo sapiens, become the last hominid species on the planet. We are all we have today. Right, there are no other hominid species. We are we are at the the, the tail end. Yeah, uh, everything. If our species is 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 to adapt and change, it'll be it'll take place in the future. But but we, there's no going back to our previous ancestral heritage. That's behind us. That's history now. But we eventually walk to the coastline. Yeah? We get to Indonesia, and then we walk down this, uh, this land bridge, yeah? and we cross over to the Solomon Islands, yeah? and then we walk into Australia. Right? There are two peninsulas that separate Indonesia uh, from the Australian subcontinent. Right? Uh, the Indonesian side is called Sunda, and the Australian side is called Sahu. Right? There are waterways that separate the, uh, uh, these two, two subcontinents, but they are narrow. Right? They are maybe 60 nautical miles apart. You don't need any kind of sophisticated sea craft to cross those passages. You can simply tie logs together, wrap it with vines, and you can float. You don't need any kind of sophisticated system of navigation because you can see the land ahead. So basically, we pedestrians walk and float into Australia. Then about 10,000 years ago, right, after pedestrian traffic has, has basically settled the planet, right, the earth warms and these narrow waterways fill up with, 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 with ocean. And now our early pedestrian ancestors who walked in Australia are permanently trapped because they got to Australia before they created sea craft. And so now they're stuck there. They have no way to escape until they develop the technology by which they can explore the seas. But up until 50,000 years, up until 10,000 years ago, that technology didn't exist. Okay. So now, so I've taken to you through the first chapter of how humans came to the edges of the world's ocean. Now we're going to look at how people moved from the from the edges of the, of the of the continent into the world's oceans, and that that history is only about five thousand years old. A settlement of the world's oceans is is fairly fairly recent. Okay, China and Taiwan, right? So farmers living along the uh, Fujian coastline, which is the South China area, uh, here. Uh, in reaction to rising tides about 10,000 years are forced to, to rethink, again, this is, about, this is about environment influencing the way we behave, right? Rethink their, their, their food resources. And so they become more marine oriented, right? They learn how to, how to develop sea craft, they learn how to develop a better fishing techniques, and they explore, fairly close to them, is to the island of Taiwan. And then they settle, Island Taiwan. Okay. For all oceanic people, including Hawaiians, Tahitians, Samoans, 
our ancestral heritage takes us back to island Taiwan. So basically, if you're an oceanic islander, you're Chinese, okay? You, you, you're Chinese. And so in Taiwan, about 5,000 years ago, we start to develop the, uh, the technology, right, in terms of sea craft that allow us to explore the world's ocean. So, so it's in Taiwan, that's the ancestral homeland for all oceanic people. And then we move south to the Luzon Islands and the Philippines. And then we basically move out into the Pacific. And we do this by creating a craft that'll allow us to explore the ocean. And these are the first of our oceanic seagoing canoes. These are large platforms for exploration. Okay. We know the exact path that they took into the Pacific yeah, because of the artifacts they left behind, right? This is Lapita pottery. Lapita is a very dentate ornamented pottery. And with pottery, when you drop it, it breaks. So there's a trail of Lapita potsherds that, that'll point in the direction of, of Taiwan, right? So these potsherds, these potsherds are, are, are indicators of where our culture began. We also speak the same common language, Austronesian, right? Austronesian is the largest human language that spread before the spread of uh, uh, the European languages. Its range is like from the longitude of Denver, Colorado to off the coast of uh, South Africa, Madagascar. Yeah. But artifacts also can tell us that we are, um, that where our culture began, this is a stone edge. A stone, stone edge is a, a tool for, for hafting or, or, or carving, making utilitarian tools, uh, building homes, carving, uh, carving uh, statues and, uh, and building canoes, okay? About 20 years ago, two researchers wanted to study stone ads and their distribution, right? So what they proposed to do was to take 17 stone ads in the Bishop Museum okay, that came from the coral atolls of the Tuamotus. The Tuamotus is a, a band of 70, 70 coral atolls that are northeast of Tahiti. And the reason why we're just studying, studying uh, stone edges from coral atolls is, yeah, is atolls are made out of coral, right? Stone edges are made out of basalt, right? So stone edges have to come from volcanic islands. And they're gonna employ a technique called plasma mass spectrometry, by which it's an invasive process by which you take a sliver of the stone and you melt it down to its plasmatic state once it's in its plasmatic state, you can identify the mineralogical and, and, and uh, chemical uh, components of that stone ad. And then you can take that genetic signature and identify it back to the exact lava flow. You can, you can actually geographically place it where that stone ad began, uh, uh, came from. And so they're studying the distribution of, of stone ads on coral atolls because they know all these stone ads had to be imported. And so does that stone ads, that small stone ads, began here in Napuka Atoll. But it came from a quarry here in Hawaii on the island of Kaholawe, some 4,300 kilometers away. And it came from this particular ads quarry on the island of Kaholawe, and an ads quarry located at a place called Keala Ikahiki. Keala Ikahiki translated means the road to ancestral lands. So that this stone was, was transported, right? This is, this is definitive scientific evidence of the transport of stone tools between large archipelagos, undisputed, undisputed. And so that's the kind of evidence we, uh, we sought out, right? So the migration east into, into, the, uh, in, into the Pacific began about, uh, about, about 5,000 years ago in, in Taiwan uh, about 4,500 years ago, they're moving through the Philippines. About 2,300 years ago, they're arriving in, in Fiji, Tonga, and some more. And after about a thousand years of residing in Western Polynesia, they start to build all the traits in terms of linguistics and in terms of artifacts, in terms of social practices that we identify as Polynesian. Polynesia is made up of, of, of the Polynesian Triangle. Uh, it is made up of the, of the corners of Hawaii, uh, Easter Island, 
and New Zealand, yeah, in the, in the Southwest, East Island, in the Southeast, and then the islands that fill the center of the triangle, right? These three places, Hawaii, Easter Island, and New Zealand, was probably the last place on the planet to be settled. Hawaii has been settled by, uh, for about a thousand years. Uh, uh, Easter Island or Rapa Nui has been settled for about 900 years. And uh, New Zealand or Aotearoa has only been settled for about 800 years. We are culturally the newest, the newest uh, people on the, on the earth. But their range was extensive. Their range is, they get as far, far as South America. We know they had to have gotten to South America because of the Polynesian sweet potato. The Polynesian sweet potato is a South American cultivation. It grows in South America, right? the walla. Right? In fact, in fact the, 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 uh, the South American word for, uh, for sweet potato, it's very similar to, to walla. I think it's, it's kumara. Uh, anyway, that, that South American uh, uh, arrival is equal to the longitude of Denver, Colorado. So they get as far east as Denver, Colorado, and they get as far west as Madagascar off the coast of uh, Africa. Madagascar was never settled by Africans first. It was settled by, by people coming out of the Pacific Ocean. We were the first, first people to arrive. That is about 2,300 kilometers, the largest, the largest human exploration of the planet. And so that brings our, 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 our chapter of how humans came to the world's oceans and how, how humans moved into the world's ocean to a close, right? We as oceanic people are part of a greater, a, a greater race called the human race. Uh, and we are all, whether we're walking or sailing, explorers of our planet, right? And the reason and, and, and what allowed us was that humans are smart. We created a way to explore the world's oceans, right? By building these, these sophisticated sea craft called voyaging canoes. And we also, we also, as we sailed, we learned how to use the stars to guide us. And it, that just came from natural observation of being out in the environment, of recognizing that there is this pattern of movement of celestial bodies from one horizon to the next, and that it is constant, it is steady, it is like our heartbeat, right? It keeps on coming from one horizon and moves across the night sky and it enters the opposite horizon. In the 1970s, a group of Hawaiian researchers wanted to, wanted to uh, uh, solidify the, the, the argument that, that, that oceanic people uh, created their own destinies, we created their own destinies by, by creating the sophisticated sea craft, sophisticated system of, of navigation. But, uh, but there was a lot of other researchers who argued against the purposeful exploration and settlement of the, of the uh, Pacific, people like Andrew Sharp and Thor Heyerdahl. Uh, and so in the 1970s, they create a project by which they're gonna rebuild an artifact and they're gonna test it on a traditional route. And from that test, they're gonna evaluate and they're gonna arrive at, at pertinent information that can help, help forward the arguments for purposeful exploration of the Pacific. So in uh, 1975, they launched the sailing canoe Hokulea. So Hokulea is a design accurate canoe, it's not construction accurate. In other words, uh, it conforms to the construction design of a traditional Voyage canoe, but it is made out of marine plywood and, and fiberglass. Okay. On board the canoe, right, they recruit a Pacific Islander who is still skilled in the, the art of oceanic wayfinding. His name is Mao Piailog. He lives on the tiny atoll, uh, coral atoll of, of Sarawal. Uh, he is a traditionally trained uh, oceanic navigator. Uh, and he agrees, they, they request his help, and he agrees to come to Hawaii to help navigate Hokulea. So in 1976, after being out on the sea for 33 days, they arrive in Tahiti. Uh, and and, uh, and, and the, the experiment, right, the sailing of a traditional voyaging canoe is, uh, is meets with 100% uh, uh, success, right? So the, 
the, the scientific experiment is, 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 uh, is validated. But the social experiment, right? The ability for people to live well on a small enclosed platform, well, that, that history had been lost. We hadn't, we hadn't sailed on canoes for, for over 600 years. So the kind of discipline you need, uh, the kind of behavior you need to exhibit to live cohesively as a human unit on, on a canoe, we, we've forgotten that. Mao and his culture, because they go out on the ocean, they know what it takes and they know how you need to respect authority on a vessel. And, and so the social experiment is, is, doesn't meet the, the standard of success. And, and quite frankly, they, they, the crew is so stressed that when they get to Tahiti, there's, there's confrontation and, and it results in a physical altercation. Mao is so disgusted with the behavior of the canoe. He, he gets to shore and he just writes this scathing letter to the, to the voyaging society and says, uh, the behavior of the crew is unacceptable. Uh, the crew is supposed to sail back to Hawaii and, and I'm supposed to continue to navigate. They may be the same. So I'm going to depart the crew now. I bid you guys farewell. Don't ever come find me because you will never find me in my islands. And so he, 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 uh, he leaves the project. The project is stuck in Tahiti without a navigator. So they're forced to navigate the canoe back to Hawaii with instruments, with a sextant. Uh, and so on board the canoe is this young, pretty, very intelligent Hawaiian by the name of Nainoa Thompson. And he fills his notebook up with, with all kinds of notes about what he's observing at night. And when he returns to Hawaii, he decides, he decides that he's going to redirect his course of study at the university. And he's going to re-engineer the, uh, the art of non-instrument navigation. And so he starts studying all the relative sciences uh, in a system of non-instrument navigation, there's a lot of math, right? Uh, sailing canoes is all about wind, so there's meteorology. Uh, it's about stars, so there's astronomy. And it's about ocean, so there's oceanography. So he builds this, this curriculum that'll help prepare him for an eventual test to navigate a canoe without instruments. But it is math and science-based, yeah? It is math and science-based. It is based upon academics. Right. So in 1978, we we uh, we decided to sail Hokulea back to uh, back to Tahiti. Uh, we recruit crew, and we find uh, there's a crew of, of of young Hawaiians on board. One is a one is an individual by the name of Eddie Aikau. Eddie Aikau in 1978 was the most significant big wave rider in in Hawaiian history. Right. He just Right before the, the 1978 voyage, I see him on ABC Wide World of Sports, and he's, he's winning a, a surf contest on the, on the North Shore. Incredible individual who, who was so different from any other young Hawaiian I knew at the time. He lived, he, he and his parents lived in a cemetery. Uh, they were caretakers of the cemetery. He lived in his own house next to his parents' house. His name was Edward Ryan Makua Hanai Aikau. Makua Hanai means to care for parents. And so he looked after his parents. Uh, every Sunday, no matter how big the surf was, they would go to church. Religiously, they would go to surf. Church. He was clean. He drove this old beat up VW bug, but he didn't allow anybody to smoke in it. He kept it clean. He kept all his surfboards in, in his ceiling. It was like his children. He never could separate himself from his surfboard. He was, he, he averaged about 367 saves a year as a lifeguard on the North Shore. And he was, he was one of the first two, the very first two lifeguards in Hawaii's history. So March 16 is their departure date, 1978. And they leave late in the evening and they're loading a lot of equipment on the, on the back of the canoe and the, the stern is super heavy. They get about four hours out and no one's watching the back of the canoe. And then they take a wave on the stern they don't notice that one of the hatch covers is loose and it starts to fill the stern compartment up with water. And if you know boats, is if you don't get the excess water out of the hull quickly, then, then it's going to, the next wave is going to fill it further and it's going to keep accelerating that process until you can no longer build a canoe out and it's, it swamps. The canoe 
after four hours of being out on the sea, only four hours, they swap and they turn over and they capsize. During the following uh, day, Eddie volunteers to go for help. Uh, he takes a surfboard and he pedals off to the horizon. Later on that, that night, the, the crew is spotted by the last plane, the last plane that's flying from, from Kona on, on Hawaii Island to Oahu. Uh, and the pilot says, you're lucky because, because the plane was delayed and the delay forced them to fly further south. And he says, in the cockpit, the, 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 the windows are at an angle. And so if they weren't positioned further south, you wouldn't be able to see the flares from the canoe. And he said, we were the last flight between Hawaiian Islands. Uh, the canoe had already floated into, uh, into a flight vector for planes that, that, that traveled between only Hawaii and Tahiti. And they only traveled that route once a week. And so the crew is rescued, but we lose, we lose one crew member, Eddie Aikau. And so if you look at the Polynesian Voyaging Society and we as voyage historically, we have a disastrous beginning, right? We get into a uh, physical altercation on the way to Tahiti. And in 1978, we killed one of our crew members and we are despondent. Uh, people are clamoring and saying, uh, you should put the canoe in a museum. You know, there's no need to go out and voyage. You, 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 you did that in 1976, you proved that it can be done. But that didn't satisfy our our immense connection to the ocean. So we, we assemble a crew and it's mostly Hawaiians, it's, it's all natives. And we recommit, we recommit to, uh, to building the canoe better. We're gonna rebuild the canoe and then we're gonna go back out on the ocean and we're gonna continue the challenge and we're gonna go, we're gonna go find Tahiti. So that's 1978, 1979 is, is things start to change, right? We're rebuilding the canoe. Uh, Mainoa's got his tested academic system of, 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 of non-instrument navigation, but he is challenged spiritually and he doesn't know how to deal with the spiritual questions. So he goes to his father and his father's a, a great social scientist and his father listens to Nainoa and he tells Nainoa, well, there's only one obvious, one obvious, uh, resolution to your problem. You got to go find Mao and bring Mao back to Hawaii to round out your, uh, round out your, your, your training. You need a tradi traditional component to it. You need that to, to bolster your, your spirit and understand the spiritual connection that we as a people, oceanic people, have to the ocean. So and I know here's that Mao is sailing his canoe to Saipan. He flies to Saipan and on the beach they meet. And they're both apologetic. I know is apologetic for what happened in 1976. Mao's also ap apologetic for abandoning the crew. And Nainoa invites him back to Hawaii and Mao says, well, we'll see. And Nainoa leaves Saipan without a commitment for Mao to come back to Hawaii. And so several months pass and Nainoa gets a phone call from a customs agent at Honolulu airport. And he said, uh, Mr. Mao Piailag is at the airport. You need to come here and pick him up. And so, in 1979 and 1980, we start to reestablish this connection to the wayfinding tradition. And navigation becomes this hybrid system, of not just non-instrument navigation, but, 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 but wayfinding. When Mao compares his system with Nainoa's, they're, 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 they're identical, they're identical. There's only so many ways you can, you, you can go to create a system of, 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 of non-instrument navigation. And they happen to develop, Nainoa happens to develop a system that is identical to Mao's. And so Mao tells us a story that he comes to Hawaii to help teach the Hawaiians how, how to sail the canoe so that we won't kill anybody, right? And, but he doesn't commit to sail with us. He only, comes, he only commits to come to Hawaii to, to teach us. But he eventually, after he works with us, decides that he's going to sail with us. And so since 1980, uh, uh, Hokulea has sailed successfully, navigated successfully to, to every landfall that we've 100% we accuracy to every landfall that we, 
we, we, we chose it to, to target. And we built a very healthy, wholesome organization built around uh, a clear vision, compelling mission, and grounded to, to uh, a great tradition of human values that helps propel our movement forward. Okay, so the difference between wayfinding, wayfinding encompasses all the all of the ways in which a, a, uh, people and animals orient themselves in, in a physical space and navigate from place to place. is often used to refer to traditional navigation methods used by indigenous people. Non-instrument navigation, on the other hand, is based upon academics, math, science, uh, navigation, and it basically refers to navigation, but without the use of instruments. Okay. Three things you need to do in a system of, of non-instrument navigation. One is you need to orientate the canoe. You need a device, right? Second, you need to position the canoe. That's, that's in our system, it's called dead reckoning. It's locating the vessel along a course, uh, course line. And then lastly, you need, to, you need a safe arrival. So you gotta expand the landfall target to make it big enough for you to be able to identify it, right? Those are the three things. There's only three things you need to do, okay? Our device for which we navigate is called the uh, Sidereal Star Compass. It is made up of 32 stones, right? This is the model for that we teach. We teach it by array arraying 32 stones in a circle. The circle uh, mimics the visual horizon, the horizon being any place in the sky touches the land or the sea. Yeah, 32 stones. 30 on the eastern horizon, right? The arriving horizon, right? The eastern side. And 30 on the western horizon, the, 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 the entering side of the compass. Yeah? And the two stones on the two points that the sky turns on, which is your celestial poles, north and south. Okay? The way the compass works, and this is, this is Nainoa's compass, right? He divides it up into four cardinal points. Hiki, in other words, hiki means to arrive or east. And the opposite of Yikina is the word Komohana. Komohana means to enter. So arriving horizon, right? Half the circle. Komohana, half the circle. And then Akao and Hema. Akao means right or north. Hema means south or left. These are the two points that the sky turn in. Okay? The way the stars move across from the sky to sky is, is that it moves, it moves in parallel directions, right? So let me go back. So those four cardinal points divide the star compass up into four quadrants, right? The names of the, each quadrant are the same in the east and the same in the, the west. Yeah, it is same in the, in the southern side and the northern side. So, so the, the names on either side of the compass is la, meaning sun, aina, meaning land, noyo, meaning bird, uh, certain kind of bird, mano, meaning bird, nalani, meaning heavens, naleo, meaning the... Uh, uh, the voices in Hakka meaning empty. We call these points Hakka, Hakka in the north, Hakka in the south, meaning empty because around the north and south celestial pole is basically void of stars. There's hardly anything down there that you can see visually with your eyes. So we call it Hakka. Okay. The stars move from the house of the same name. They migrate in parallel tracks across the compass, right? Here they're entering the compass on the Hikina side. They're climbing, climbing, climbing. When it gets above your head, that's the highest point in the sky. Then it starts to descend and it's gonna exit the compass, the same house it arrived in, but in the opposite horizon. Yeah. Okay. But this is an oceanic compass, right? Where you gotta be able to incorporate the wind and the waves. So the wind and the waves, they move across the, from quadrant to quadrant. They move from the house of a same, house of a, a same name to the house of the exit in the house of the same name, but opposite quadrant. So here, if this is a wave, the orange line here, right? And it's moving from the house we call Manu in the quadrant we call Kola, or if this is the wind that's blowing, it's gonna move from Manu Kola, and it's gonna exit here in Manu Kona. So this system allows you to incorporate anything visually that's a clue for direction finding. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, Whereas a magnetic compass focuses on one bearing point, magnetic north, this sidereal compass allows you to incorporate a number of different elements for orientation. A magnetic compass is a good device, okay? but the, they, work, they, work on a, they work on one only allows you to focus on one bearing point and the other allows you to incorporate everything in nature within, within the, uh, the guidance system. 
Okay. The reason why our compass works is that our islands basically lie within the tropic, right? The tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn, where the stars rise vertically. I often pose a question to audiences. What would our compass look like? Would we have been able to develop our com compass if we lived at the North Pole? North Pole, stars don't set. They just move along the horizon, right? We had a great, uh, uh, a great chance to create a system based upon our geographical location within the world. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to teach you in the night sky real quick how we see it, right? And we do it by, uh, by this chant. It's called Ohi Ohi Inapono. Voyagers, gather up your possessions. And the reply is, He kahe ivi he makahe lupi. A bailer, a bone, a fish, and a kite, right? Ulako ka ipu akahoke, the God of the Navigator's provision. We see the night sky differently, right? Whereas, uh, whereas based upon uh, Greek, Arabic, and Latin traditions, you see constellations, small constellations. We see bands of constellations that are strung together to create pictures. And a picture is a baler, a bone, a fish hook, and a kite. And they are basically four, that makes up the four star families. And the star families uh, run from north to south, right? Divide the sky up into four components, right? You have two star families up at night, and uh, you have two star families below your feet, and they're moving from east to west. And in, given in a 24, in, in, in a 12 hour period, you should be able to, to see three of the four star families, right? The other, the fourth star family would be up in the day. Yeah, so the baler, the bone, the fish hook, and the kite. Okay, so the baler, a baler is a scoop to bail water out of a, a, a canoe, right? That is made up of this semicircle of stars, right? You look for a bright constellation that helps to synergize this star family, and that is Orion's belt, right? Orion's belt, right? This is this is Capella in the Northeast. Uh, the twins of Gemini, Castor and Pollux. Procyon, little dog, and Sirius, the brightest star in, in, uh, in the night sky. And down here that makes up the handle of the baler is Canopus. You can see Canopus from the United States. You can see it from uh, the Southern United States, San Diego, Arizona, uh, New Mexico, Texas, and all of Florida, right? In the middle of this baler is, is Orion. If you draw a line through Orion, the, the line points towards Sirius. You draw a line, line northward, it points to Aldebaran and Taurus the Bull, and it terminates in the Pleiades or Makali'i. Okay? The bone, the bone is, is a genealogy of stars. Right? Again, looking for one bright constellation. This is the Big Dipper. Two stars in the Big Dipper point towards uh, Polaris. You come off the handle of Big Dipper, you come to Arcturus, Hokulea, which is the zenith star for Hawaii. Spica, and then these four stars, Corvus the Crow. If you draw a line through the center of Corvus the Crow, it points towards a Southern Cross, which you cannot see from the United States, but you can't see from Hawaii. Yeah. And then the fish hook. Uh, the fish hook is made up of what we see as the fish hook, which is Scorpio, uh, right? Scorpio, and this triangle in the North, the summer triangle made up of Vega, uh, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. Uh, we see that as, as the, uh, a spool of fishing line that circles around to the top of the fish hook and it is fishing after Sagittarius, which is here, Sagittarius, which is right here, and in the spout of Sagittarius, or we call it the celestial teapot, here's the top of the teapot, the handle, and then the, the spout. In the middle of the spout is the center of the Milky Way galaxy. If you ever want to know where the center of our galaxy is, we just look towards Sagittarius. That bowl of dust, the dustiest part of the sky, is the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And then lastly is, is the kite. The kite is made up of the four stars of the great square of Pegasus. And these stars are named, as a, as named after a, a lineage of chiefs. So four star families, right? The baler, the bone, the fish hook, and the kite. And that's the way we oceanic voyagers see the night sky. And the idea is, is that you, you, once you memorize the positions of the stars, you don't have to see the whole star line to know where uh, their relationships in the night sky are. You can, you can basically identify one star and know where the connecting patterns are. Okay. Our system of navigation is, is, is visual, right? 
right? Here's the rising sun. I know it's looking at the oceanic swells, lining the oceanic swells up with the, with the one definitive bearing point, which is the rising sun. He's feeling, he's feeling the direction of the wind. He's sensing the motion of the canoe as it makes, as it travels its path across the ocean. Okay. Okay. Our navigation is visual, right? We take everything in through our eyes and then we internalize it through our bodies. Uh, the next thing you need, we need to do on our system is, is position the canoe. And we do this basically by an uh, algebraic formula. It's basically, the, we know, we, we need to figure out the speed of the canoe. We need to multiply it by time, which will equate to distance. And then we need to compute distance into direction, right? So we have places on a canoe where we, by we can measure the speed, right? Um, and we have time, basically, basically, 12 hour increments, sunrise to sunset, where we compute time. And the way we do that is, is this is a measured distance between these, these cross pieces. When a wave hits the side of the canoe, it'll roll down to the back cross piece. And we count how many seconds it takes to, for a wave to float all the way to the back of the canoe. And then the basic number is 25. Divide how many seconds it took into the number 25. So if it takes 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000, right? Five seconds, divide five into 25. That equates to five knots. So you do that over a period of time for, for 12 hours. And basically, if you come up with the average speed of five knots, then five times 12 equals 60. You've traveled 60 miles along your course time. So this is math and science computing, right? And basically, what you're doing is you're keeping track of how far along a course. This is a course between Hawaii and Titi. How far along a course you're traveling, right? So you can position the canoe. But we can also use our hands to measure the altitude of stars to position our, uh, our, our canoe on a cross as we move, move south. So we use our hands, right? We calibrate our hands exactly. And when stars are in zenith, uh, we use our hands to measure the actual altitude of stars across the sky. So here's an example, right? Here's a Southern Cross in Meridian, right? It's up and down, so it's pointing south, right? In Hawaii, when the stars is the top star and the bottom star is the same distance to the horizon, you're at the latitude of the Hawaiian Island. So when you get the top star and the bottom star equal to the horizon, you're at the latitude of Hawaii. When you leave Tahiti, that, that constellation is a lot higher in the sky. But as you approach Tahiti, it gets closer and closer to the horizon. We also have archeological sites. Here's an ast astro archeo site. It's called a sighting wall. And the way this sighting wall works is, is it is used to identify the meridian. So here's the Southern Cross and it's upright above the sighting wall. So one edge of the wall is east, one edge of the wall is west, and then down the middle of the wall is north and south. Again, our eyes are visual. The stars tell us when we're approaching land and it's important for us to know when you're approaching land so you can go out and and locate the island, right? Because these, these coral atolls uh, in the Southern Pacific, are, uh, they're, they're razor sharp coral reefs that's around it. And you don't wanna be sailing around at night without knowing exactly your position. As you approach land, right? The stars telling you when you're getting close, you're looking for, for signals of land, seaweed. Won't tell you where the islands lie, but it's telling you when you get in the vicinity. But these birds, uh, these are white terns. The white terns are great clues for identifying land. When you see a white turn, you you know, could be 48 hours for finding land. And as with the Southern Cross is, we employ a system called upwind sailing. When you're at the proper latitude of the islands, then you simply turn your canoe downwind and let the wind blow you towards these islands. So I'm just gonna go through real quickly uh, uh, an example of a voyage, okay. Uh, this is the Polynesian Triangle. And it was the, really the, the last voyage. The last voyage was to Easter Island. Easter Island was the, it took us guys a whole generation, 25 years to figure out how we're gonna to navigate to it. Because that island is so small. It's only seven miles long and two miles wide. So how, and it's all by itself. And so it was, it was kind of held off until we could felt confident in our skills to go ahead and find it. Yeah. Another issue is, is Easter Island is upwind. It's like 1600 miles upwind. So, so 
the wind would be coming straight from the bow and that the only way we, we could get there is by executing these long, arduous tacks of beating up wind. And we figured out it would take us 40 days to get there. Um, so we had to physically do some changes to the canoe. We changed ourselves, changed ourselves so that we went with this Marconi modern day sail configuration so that the canoe would have better performance. But we also, and we are traditional people, but we are also scientists, we're smart, right? Humans are smart and because we're part of a smart human race. We studied climatology for years in trying to figure out how we could execute a sail plan that could get us there a lot quicker. And what we noticed was that the wind's going to reversals, right? The wind's going to reversals. The winds usually come from east here to west across the compass. We know that the winds will usually switch around to the north. And so we chose a month when we could possibly get those north winds. And this is September, and it just so happened we were waiting on, uh, on Mangareva for about uh, two weeks, and the wind switched around to the north, and we just left and departed. And every day we got up, and the winds were continuing to blow us guys directly to Easter Island. In fact, we got there so quick, 40 days, we made it there in 19 days. We got there two weeks before our arrival party showed up. Okay, so what we know about Easter Island is that uh, uh, are the stone monoliths called Moai. Uh, I picked up the canoe in uh, Marquesas uh, Islands and I sailed the canoe south towards Mangareva. And then we assembled the crew that was gonna uh, sail to, uh, to Easter Island. Our first stop along the way on these north winds was, was this lonely island all by itself, Pitcair, 40, 42 people there, all descendants of, well, most of them, I'd say 80% of the population are descendants of Fletcher Christian, right? From the mutiny of the, on the bounty. Uh, but every day we got up and, and we kept sailing east. Uh, it was, it was very a stressful sail because because again, we're looking for a small target and our navigation has to be, there's more, no margin for error, right? Uh, and so we're super serious. But at the end of 19 days, on the morning of the 19th day, uh, we, were, we, we, knew, we knew we made tremendous progress towards the island and, and now we're executing series of small attacks, searching for the island. Uh, someone points to the bow and way off in the distance, we see this cone shaped black shadow and sure enough, it was Rapa Nui. It, was not, it had to be Rapa Nui because it's the only island in that corner of the Pacific Ocean. So welcoming the, um, the first Rapa Nui on board the canoe. Uh, all the stone statues come from one quarry on the island called Rano Roraku. Uh, most of the, st in fact, all the stone moai was toppled over into in a series of battles and upheavals, cultural upheavals. Uh, when, when the population gets stressed, right? Population in this place was depleting the food resources and control of the food resources created this, uh, this, this campaign of intertribal warfare and the way they, they, they stole the mana, the power of, the, of, of each tribe was they were, they toppled over the, uh, the, the stone statues. They placed a position, a rock in the back so that when it, the statue fell over, it would snap the, uh, the head from the body. And so I believe in the, in the 1960s, 1970s, they began uh, resurrecting the stone statues. But in, the, in a, a cultural practice that replaced, was, uh, replaced the, the Moai cult was the, was the Orongo. Orongo is a bird cult. They have a series of uh, these stone, um, stone houses on the, on the uh, northeast, uh, uh, north, north, east corner of the island. And on that corner of the island, there is a smaller island called uh, Motu Iti, means small island. And Orongo means bird call. And so those contestants, every tribe would have a, one male contestant. When they heard the bird call, they would scamper down the cliff, swim across to the island, and wait for the first egg to be laid. And then they would bring the egg back. Whoever brought the first egg back unbroken, climbed up the, the, the cliff, presented it to the chief, became the bird man. And then basically the Birdman controlled all food resources for the uh, immediate future. Okay, so our last major project is, 
uh, was the worldwide voyage. It took place in 2013 with a with a initial sail around the state. But from 2014 to 2017, we sailed around the world. Again, our mission was was an environmental one. We wanted to learn how the world's oceans contributed to the health of the planet. Right, 70 percent of the Earth's surface is water. Uh, Sylvia Earle says, "Without the blue on the planet, there is no green. There is no green." The world's oceans is the number one regulator for climate. It regulates climate, hands down, and it produces oxygen. So we wanted to become advocates for the world's oceans, but we needed to learn about it. The second thing was our educational platform. As we sail from community to community, we wanted to record stories of, of, of NGOs or schools or communities that was doing good, good stewardship uh, project and then to post it on our website. So at the end of the voyage, you could see a collection of stories of people that was doing good stewardship work around the planet. And lastly, and most importantly, which res truly resonated with me was that we wanted to meet uh, the cultures of the islands, uh, of, 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 the, of those communities, the indigenous people, because those are the first peoples to those communities. And they know their relationship goes back to their beginnings, their beginning in time, right? So the Malaman Honua Worldwide Voyage was 60,000 miles, nautical miles, 150 ports, 23 nations, took three years, one canoe and one island wreck. Uh, and so what we needed to mitigate was, uh, uh, was, was two things on the world. One was hurricanes, right? We basically sailed out around the world unscathed, very few episodes of bad weather. Only because we did, we did 10 years of climatolo climatological studies. The, the way you avoid hurricanes is you sail during the winter. Hurricanes need heat to generate itself, to sustain itself. So as long as you're sailing in the winter, you're safe. And then the last thing we had to do, and this is a human problem, these bubbles represent incidents of piracy. So you can see piracy along Somalia and along the eastern coast of, uh, of Africa is fairly substantial but around the South, and that's why we chose a course around uh, uh, South Africa is because it was basically void of, of, uh, of incidents of piracy. Mm -hmm. Seven thousand years ago, the first really oceanic people came out of China and came out of Taiwan. Then you get to Polynesia, this oceanic country bounded by Hawaii in the north and New Zealand in the southwest and Rapa Nui in the east. 10 million square miles, bigger than Russia. And it was discovered by these extraordinary people. They were really the astronauts of our ancestors. They were the greatest explorers on the face of the earth. You know, our ancestors not were only just great navigators, they were great stewards of these islands. The time that the first Europeans came, the journals of Captain Cook talked about, you know, large populations, maybe 800,000. That, that's the median. It could be even higher. It's approaching maybe the numbers of people that are living on Hawaii today. They figured it out, how to live well on these islands, and I think that is the challenge of the time for planet Earth and all of humanity. It's to figure that out. How are you going to do that? Hokulea is pulling us into a direction of asking the question, are you going to be responsible and are you going to take action? Are you going to do something with what you have? You got a voyage in Kuro. Hokulea, to us, to go around the world, has this enormous potential to go to 40, 50 countries on the planet, to be with the great navigators on Earth. And I'm not talking about those in canoes. I'm talking about those who are doing things to give kindness and compassion to the earth and those who live on it, those navigators. We're not going to change the world, but we're going to go and build a network of people around the earth who are going to change it. And our job is to help them be successful.
we're going to go around the world. And I wouldn't take the risk to do it because the greater risk is to not act. The greater risk is to be apathetic. The greater risk is to remain ignorant. And the greater risk is not to take action. In three years, Hokula'a traveled more than 40,000 nautical miles, stopping at over 100 ports of call across 27 nations. Her crews connected with some of the world's greatest influencers and engaged with those creating innovative solutions to protect our island Earth. In my humble opinion, the success of the Worldwide Voyage was really building relationships from strangers from around the world. I watched our crew members Every single place we went to, uh, everybody that they met was treated with respect and with decency. That was the key and the core to the success of the voyage. That is why we have strangers turn into relationships and relationships are now coming together as a movement around the same thing, caring values. Malama Honua. Hokulea returned safely to Hawaii, welcomed by a network of people from around the world who have been inspired by her voyage. What I'm really thinking about more and more now, and just imagining, you know, just imagine where Hawaii is going to be in 20 years. I mean, all these kids coming up, they're just going to be extraordinary leaders. What we need to do is stay on course, keep going, move inspiration into action, and really help move the movement of kindness around the earth so that it starts to have real impact. And you need to do that through, through your core relationship and build others. And get Malama Honuo off the canoe into the communities. People need to know about what people are doing in classrooms, in our universities, in, in their backyards, in a coral reef, in the watershed, in our lo'i, in our fish ponds. I mean, we need to just capture the stories. It's going to start to celebrate all these people that, that people don't know. This is the canoe, and it's our communities that have been navigators. I think we're on course but the voyage ain't over. It's, I mean, it's that simple. So we've arrived at the end of our story, Daima. Again, this is, this is a human story, right? It it's, it's, begins in Africa and it ends up in the, in the largest ocean on the, on the face, of, face of the planet. But, but it's hard for me to tell the, the get to the closing chapter without addressing, addressing the beginning chapters. And so this is a human story and this story belongs to all of us. We all fit within, within, within the story and it's up to us to find a place where we fit within, within the story and the, and, and the morals of the story and, and, and to realize that that, 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 that that understanding the story is really an investment in ourselves and our, uh, in our future. And lastly, for those of you that are interested, uh, I'm hosting a, a, a webinar next week, Friday at 4 p.m. Hawaii time, uh, 4 to 5.30, followed with uh, uh, the last, from 5.30 to 6 o'clock, uh, a Q&A. Uh, it's entitled Hokulea and the Revival Begins. It's about, uh, it's about the formative years of the Polynesian Voyaging Society, and uh, and and really, it's about how we started as an organization, and and and, and it's, it's to be honest, it's about really the all the mistakes we made, but then, but then to to recognize that we eventually got to building a successful a culture of success, but we we needed to go through these baby steps and make mistakes and learn how to how we organizationally structure ourselves around again a clear mission uh, a clear vision uh, a compelling mission and and, and and strong values that that guide our organization so I'm going to stop sharing
and I'm going to turn it back to Nancy and Marcia. Oh, Kalepa, mahalo nui. That is just fabulous. That was such a terrific presentation. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. I learned a tremendous amount. That was wonderful. Um, I think that our viewers also had a great time with your presentation and we got a bunch of really great questions just from the presentation and we'll go through those if you wish and then we can okay. head back to the ones that we had picked up from registration. Okay. Okay. So um, one person asks, um, can you please help us understand in more detail how you keep the canoe oriented on course in the east-west or longitudinal direction? Oh, longitude. Longitude, you, you, uh, you cannot tell longitude with, with non-instrument navigation. You need a chronometer. So we don't, um, we use dead directing to establish lo longitude. So, so the way it, it probably worked, right, and again, this is, uh, as people moved into the Pacific, from a west to east direction, right? They'll probably wait for the winds to go into with these wind reversals like we did with Rapa Nui, and they will allow the winds to blow them in a direction as they search for land. They would memorize how many days or how many moons it took them to cross over from one island to the next. And then once they found an island with that memorized information, that became part of their oral tradition for finding that particular island. And so, and so uh, when the winds reversed itself back to its normal weight, uh, pattern, they could sail back home. But whenever they would need to sail out to those, those, those islands that was east of them, they would have to wait for the winds to go to reversal and they would have to recall how many moon nights it took them to get there. So you would need to memorize how long it took you to travel past uh, a passage and you need to memorize what direction you sailed in. So you cannot tell longitude. You can tell latitude very accurately, but you, there's nothing you can do to uh, uh, tell longitude. That's why we call it wayfinding. Yeah. yeah. If you want accurate navigation, use a GPS. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another person asked um, about the cat's cradle on your map. And um, we know that there are, are string figures used in uh, in indigenous education all over the world. Can you yeah. tell us a bit about how uh, it's used in the teaching of nat navigation? Well, you know, about uh, maybe maybe about, let me see, 1985, 1987. Yeah, in the, in the late 1980s, see, up until the late 1980s, we're calling their name, uh, the names of the stars by their by their uh, Greek and Latin names, right? Instead of calling a star uh, uh, Arc, uh, Hokulea, we called it Arcturus, right? And then we made a, a conscious decision that we would start to bring the Hawaiian language back into into uh, into our naming process. So uh, so that's how we started to create these these star patterns. And for us, for us, the uh, Cat's Cradle or Orion just looks like look like a string figure game right that's a that's a modern interpretation of of what we saw in the night sky but you know culture is dynamic it's not static right you have to keep on building adding things to your culture that is relevant in in the a context that you live today so 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 we started to incorporate language we started to to see images that were relevant and we started to create patterns in the night sky in, in terms of the the four star families that created our view about how we saw the night sky. And this is, this is a progression of culture, right? We, we keep on developing tools or heuristic devices, tools that are good for, for learning and teaching that are applicable uh, to enhance cultural beliefs. Okay. Wow, that, that's fabulous. Well, um, we are a little short of time, so I'm going to hand you back to uh, Nancy. And um, Nancy, if you have more questions, you can work with that, or I know you had something, some wrapping up that you'd like to do. So, Kalepa, thank you a thousand times. That was just fabulous. Thank you. Am I unmuted now? I'm hoping I am. 
Um, thank you so much, Kalepa. I can't tell you how grateful we are to have you. Had been our fifth speaker for this series. Um, your presentation has done so much to continue the tone and quality of what we were intending to share in this series. And it has been such an honor to host you today. Um, we are recording all the speakers' presentations. They will be available on our Indigenous Education Institute website, which is www.indigenouseducation.org. And the records will contain the entire presentation. To all of you who have found your way to this presentation, I want, you, I want to say that my partners and I are most grateful for the investment of your time and hope we've piqued your interest. I want to extend a special thank you to our technical support, Chris Terran of Terran Solutions, and Art Ferraro, Jeff Cooper, and Almir Lankaric from BLM Cater. Um, uh, also want to acknowledge the BLM San Juan's National Monument and its Superintendent Marcia de Chardonnay, as well as the San Juan Island National Historical Park and its Superintendent Alexis Freddy and Joe Dolan, Park Cultural Anthropologist, for their support and funding. Also, Chris Hout, who is one of our technical support people from Cater. Um, we will be sending an email out to you just after this presentation with a very short survey asking your reaction to what you've heard today. Please take the time to answer the questions because it is really helpful for us to inform our future program design. This is also a save the date. We are going to take a holiday break for the next two months. We will skip November with its Thanksgiving and December with Christmas, and we'll come back in January for our sixth speaker. And I'm very happy to announce that our next speaker is Dr. Henrietta Mann. Henrietta Mann, she's a Southern Cheyenne woman. She's a distinguished educator. She's a former college president, and she's founder member of the ACES Council of Elders. For Henrietta Mann, stressing the importance of education has been a lifelong mission. She's also the last remaining founding member of the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, ACES, of the Council of Elders, a distinguished group of dedicated individuals who provide cultural guidance and support to the entire ACES family. Um, one of my favorite of her many honors is being designated as one of the top 10 leading professors in the United States by Rolling Stone magazine in 1991. She was also honored with the Lifetime Achievement Award by ATALM, Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums. This award honors her work as a guardian of culture and lifeways. So we would love to have you return for Grandmother Henry's talk, which will take place on January 21st at noon Pacific time. Thank you so much for your interest and we'll see you soon. Um, Ahihe, hagone, and goodbye. And Chris, if we have any more time, we could go back and let Kalepa answer um, one last question, but I'm not sure we are, I think we're almost out of time. I think if Kalepa would like to answer some, we still have some attendees in um, presence. So uh, that's uh, over to Kalepa. Okay, let me see. Uh, given extremely isolated location of the Hawaiian Islands and the relatively late discovery of their voyages from the south. Is there any oral record or estimate of how many canoes sailed northward never to be heard of? Yeah, that's a good question. So how many, how many canoes actually never made a landfall? We don't know because there's no record of that. We just don't know. I, you have to assume, you have to assume that, that, there, that there must have been uh, a few canoes that never made landfall, but, but you also have to understand that these people were skilled survivalists. They could live out on the ocean uh, for a very, very long time. And so, you know, my, my, my estimate is don't, don't, don't underestimate the human's ability to, 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 to last in, a, in, in, in an environment that, that we modern humans would see extremely challenging. Uh, excellent. Okay, a lot of, a lot of mahalos. Uh, can you say something about Hawaii Loa and the yellow cedar trees we have, Alaska? Oh yeah, we we built Hawaii Loa, which is a, uh, which is after we built Hokulea, we wanted to learn how traditional canoes were made, so we 
we uh, worked on this project to build a canoe made out of uh, made out of logs. We searched Hawaii's forest for these logs, but we couldn't find them. Couldn't find. And then it became a a a, a moral question: if if we found the last two large logs, um, that we would cut them down to build this canoe, and we just couldn't do that. And so we we understood through our oral history that that Hawaiians did use. Uh, uh, logs that floated from the Pacific Northwest to build their canoes. There is there is written tradition of that, and so we went to uh, to the Pacific Northwest and engaged Judson Brown, who made us uh, guys uh, get into contact with Myron uh, uh, Byron uh, Malat, and he through the Sea Alaska Corporation gifted us two spruce large spruce logs that we built Hawaii Loa with, and and. We are forever thankful to the to to the indigenous people of, 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 of Alaska for that very generous gift. Okay. Are there any more you'd like to answer, Kalepa, or are we going to conclude now? Uh, maybe just one more. Uh, okay. So spiritually, what is your greatest takeaway from your journey on the Hokulea? Well, I think, I think my, my, my biggest takeaway at the end of the worldwide voyage is that, is that, is my, my, my recognition that, 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 that all humans across the, uh, across the planet, right? We all share the same, uh, the same needs. But most importantly, I mean, and although we come in biologically different shades of, of humanity, we're basically one species, humans. And we all care about, we care about where we're going to get our next meal. We care about taking care of our family. We care about our community. So the basic, the basic concerns of humans from one community to the next is the same. It's universal. And so in that, you can feel a sense of connection about what humans feel are the most important matters that concern them. Yeah. Again, it's about sustaining yourself, whether it's through economics or, or food resources. It's about caring for your community, making sure that your community is clean and healthy. And it's about, it's about your stewardship and your relationship with, with your family. And so with that, Chris, I'm going to sign off.